It is six o'clock. Uh, it's not six o'clock. It's not six o'clock. Okay. Every time I turn my phone on and off, it starts vibrating when I get text. Okay. Which is no good because I sleep with the phone. When Sam like, gets here, people think that it's fun to sometimes think. Assessor Agency meeting, City of Capitola. Please give us a roll call. Council Member Story. Finally here. <laughs> Council Member Peterson. Here. Council Member Brooks. Here. Council Member Bator. Here. And Mayor Bertrand. Okay. Stand Actually, I should say leaders. Council Member and Mayor and Chair and oh, your are playing Oh, come on. Oh, that's right. Tonight. This is a good Successor Agency, right? Okay. Sam, lead us off, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have additional materials? None. Okay. Any additions and deletions to the agenda? No changes. Okay. Um, this is a time for public comment. Anyone in the audience can speak on any item not on the agenda today. Seeing none, let's go back to City Council and City Council Successor, Treasurer and Staff Comments and City Council, any comments from the City Council? Yes. I'd just like to take a minute to acknowledge May 15th as a Peace Officers Memorial Day and thank all of our police officers for what they do every day. Ditto. Any other comments? Okay, staff comments. Just a very short update. We'll, this is the time of year when we usually close the lagoon at SoCal Creek in advance of Memorial Day. Unfortunately, with the forecast um, right. rain and the rain we're getting, I think, as we speak, it's thrown our plans a little bit awry. So we'll be making a call here shortly about whether or not we can proceed with the um, operating under our permits because our permits have strict requirements about when we can do the work if there's rain in the forecast or not about whether or not we're going to begin next week or whether we have to push it back a week so just to let everybody know it's not if you don't see the work starting on monday i'll let you know on friday but um we may or may not be able to close the lagoon in advance of memorial day this year okay no more comments um moving along to consent calendar we have one item is there a motion oh excuse me Anyone in the audience or any comments from city council on the consent calendar? Seeing none, back for a motion. So moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, let's go on to government hearing. Presentation of the proposed 2019-2020 fiscal year budget. And I think this is gonna come up and our finance director is going to take us on this, so you're going to give an introduction. Thank you. I'm going to kick this off, do the first couple slides. Um, before we get started in the budget hearings this year, I want to remind everybody this is the first in our series of budget hearings, and the intent tonight is really to get um, outline the proposed budget to the council and the community. In addition, identify areas of questions or concerns or further research that council would like to see um, us cover in future hearings. Um, in addition, I want to thank Jim and the department heads and everybody in finance for all the great work in preparing the budget that you have before you and is available on our website. Uh, it takes a big effort every year. I always appreciate the opportunity to go through and review it. I think it, it provides a great insight into how our city operates. Um, I have been doing this for not sure if this is the ninth or tenth budget I've done, but nevertheless, each time I come up with questions. Sometimes the same ones as from previous years, but. Um, it's always good to go back and take a look through this stuff. So our first slide, um, you know, overall, uh, our economy remains stable. Uh, that is, we're not seeing significant declines in any major revenue sources. However, we are experiencing relatively slow growth, particularly in the sales tax and TOT arenas. Um, overall, this budget is largely a status quo budget. The primary exception would be in the recreation division. Um, where we're talking about offering new youth programs in this coming fiscal year. 
Uh, that includes 1.25 new positions, 1.25 full-time equivalents, which would be increasing a three-quarter time rec assistant to full-time and adding a, a recreation assistant to be devoted to those youth programs. And we'll talk more about that later in the presentation tonight. Um, and it also includes the additional funding that was allocated for youth and business groups as part of Measure J. And we'll be talking about that, seeking council guidance on how to expend some of those funds later this evening. Um, overall, we have good news with our general fund. We have an estimated fund balance that will be ending this fiscal year, which is coming up in June 30th, a little more than a month from now, at about $1.3 million, um, $1 million in fund balance. That is in addition to our emergency and contingency and other reserve funds. Um, we will be talking about that later this evening and propose at least starting the conversation about maybe some one-time allocations of that fund balance for specific council priorities. The fund, the budget proposes to maintain our reserves at our policy levels of 10% for our emergency reserve and 15% for our contingency reserve. Um, obviously, the library is a huge focus for us as we move forward. Um, this will be the first year we hope, we anticipate, of new cannabis business tax revenue. We've projected two operators for half of a year in this budget for about $250,000. We believe that's a conservative but reasonable estimate of potential revenue. But obviously, being the first year of something, um, there's some risk involved in that revenue. Um, big picture is the PERS cost increases continue to be a significant threat and a significant um, diversion of funds from other priorities. Uh, and it will continue to be for several more fiscal years before they stabilize out. Uh, in addition, and you've heard me say this at, at budget hearings for time eternal, the city's heavy reliance on sales tax remains problematic and challenging um, and is something we need to think about as we move forward. The, this is the overall summary at the front end of our budget. The budget you see before you today is balanced. I think we're about $3,000 to the good. You can see there also the fund balance that we project of a little bit over $1.3 million in fund balance. Um, next year, we start to show budget problems. And again, this is largely driven by um, the, project, the, the, the known COLAs for our employees coupled with the PERS cost increases that we know are coming. So some of the assumptions that went into the generation of this budget, we have very good handle on the property tax. It's projected at a 4.5% growth for next year. The sales tax number deserves a little bit of explanation because from where we think it's going to end this year, it's actually down slightly. Um, part of that, though, is due to the fact that this fiscal year we got money that wasn't paid last fiscal year because the state implemented this new tax payment system. So our figures this year are, we think are about $200,000 artificially high, which really should be attributed to the prior year. So we're showing sales tax is actually a $100,000 decrease from where we end, we think we're gonna end this year. And we, we still have data to come in this year. Um, so that actually represents a minor growth in actual economic activity that we're projecting, um, but it is a decrease year over year. Sales tax, the district taxes, we have not been seeing growth. That's measure F and measure um, so we're projecting them at flat. The, di the difference you'll recall between the sales tax, <coughs> the 1% and the district taxes is that we have a few large taxpayers who don't pay district taxes because their buyers are predominantly not located within the cities. Mm -hmm. You can think car parts or heavy machine sales that may be selling outside the city. <coughs> the TOT, we're projecting relatively small growth this is essentially consistent with what we've been seeing, about 1%. Parking, 1% um, increase in overall parking revenue. We don't have changes in the parking rates, and so this would simply do, would be due to increased usage. Parking citations, we had a small dip this year. Uh, we're projecting that that will rebound. That was due to some, um, some uh, uh, injuries and some outage time uh, where we weren't, didn't have a full fleet of parking enforcement officers working. So I probably covered a couple of these things um, already. I talked about the sales tax continues to slow and remains heavily reliant on auto sales for growth. That has been our primary growth engine in our sales tax for the last several years. 
Um, we are heavily reliant on our top 25 sales tax generators, which represent about 63% of the total. Recall that sales tax is about half of our overall budget. So um, a significant punch portion of our budget comes from just 25 sales tax payers. As I mentioned before, the district tax remains flat, property tax, and that's really not, that's just, just due to Prop 13 reassessments. The Capitol Mall sale was a significant bump in uh, property tax, as well as just the continued turnover in the uh, residential real estate market. Um, TOT, as I mentioned, you know, it's, it's, our hotels do very, very well. They have very high occupancies. There's not new rooms coming on the market. The, so the growth has been relatively flat because it's really capped out at just room rates and room rates are considered quite high already. We are hoping in this coming year that with our new partner HDL to do some audits that we hope could yield some additional uh, TOT moving forward. But at this point, this budget doesn't include any new program TOT revenue associated with that. And as I mentioned before, it's the first year of, of the cannabis business tax and we anticipated six months worth of revenue from two retailers. <clears throat> and we're showing the parking revenue growth slowing where we had seen a bump previously when we went to the three hour time limit in the village. Um, we're thinking that that, that that bump is probably over at this point. Um, as I mentioned before, the unfunded liability, the UAL payments are a major cost driver in the budget. To get, put it in perspective, in 1617, a couple of years ago, it was $835,000 that we had to pay towards CalPERS for the unfunded liability. By 2425, which is kind of where we hit the, the peak, it'll be 2.3 million. So that, that essentially is one and a half district taxes, if you will, because our district tax or quarter cent taxes are about a million dollars a year. So if we were still at that same, if we'd had a fixed rate mortgage, if you will, we would have about $1.5 million more in 24, 25 available to spend on other priorities that we won't have. Um, library, as I mentioned before, it's anticipated for completion about a year from now, a little bit less at this point. Um, the budget does include some, some good news. We've seen some decreases in our liability insurance premium. This is due to some heavier claims that we had in the past moving off of our experience factors that we use with our risk JPA. In addition, uh, I want to acknowledge all the work that the, the staff has done um, on really driving down our work comp rates. We have some of the lowest work comp rates for a city of our size, if any I've ever seen, and that's really attributable to great workplace practice habits uh, by our employees and, and management by, by our department heads. So one of the things we do, as, as council knows, every year is we try to look out ahead to see where the problems are and what the scale of the problem is gonna be. And so we use a multi-year model where we are assuming certain rates of property tax growth, sales tax growth, TOT growth. Uh, we will pencil in potentially looking at new hotel revenue if we were to get a new hotel and what our cannabis tax might grow at. And you can see that this year's budget's balanced. Moving ahead, we start to have problems pretty quickly into the future. To give you a help, an understanding of what's driving those, oh, and so when you look at the multi-year assumptions, you'll see some funky things where we have essentially, you know, ones and zeros in our sales tax, and we actually have a 5% decline in 2022. That's, um, frankly, at this point, it's just a placeholder, and it's really around the mall, mall redevelopment, that if the mall were to redevelop, we see a, a potential loss of a chunk, decent chunk of sales tax and then essentially flat during the construction phase and then higher growth um, in the sales tax at the, in the out years. To give you a feeling for what's driving the deficits, about $250,000 a year um, increase comes from essentially cost of living increases for our employees. That's ballpark figure, obviously it's subject to year to year negotiations, but that's, that's a reasonable figure to use in terms of your own thinking. In addition, it's about $250,000 a year through this cycle for CalPER. So between those two, that's about $500,000 a year of budget growth on the expenditure side that we experience without changes in our service delivery model. In addition, there are other things that come up year to year. Um, the larger figure next year is, is set in some senses by a good piece of good news is that um, with our formulas for our contingency and emergency reserve, they're set at a certain percentage of our expenditures. And as expenditures rise, we have to put more money into the contingency and emergency reserve. And there's a pretty healthy chunk that we're gonna have to put in next year, which is also a piece of the increase that you see. 
So this is what graphically our five-year projection. Uh, I will note that the five-year projection doesn't include allocating any of the Measure F funds into the general fund to help um, to help with these things. I think we've all know that as we get further into Measure F, we're going to have to talk about unless we have new revenues coming online. Uh, talk about some of those Measure F funds coming in to support uh, the police department. But at this point, this projection doesn't include any of that district tax coming in for other general fund purposes. So this budget was built up on the budget principles that this council <clears throat> adopted earlier this winter. Uh, they're based on three basic fiscal policies about a balanced budget and ensuring that we're balanced, using one-time revenues for one-time expenditures and that we plan for future cost increases and think about where we're gonna go into the future. Our three public service principles about improving transparency, the high priority community places on the public safety, and then always looking at service level increases with their long-term costs. And then public improvements really geared towards making sure that we're delivering uh, the high quality public improvements to our community that everyone expects. So this is a lot on a slide. It's in your budget and the city manager's message. But what we did was we took all the key projects and programs that the council identified and voted on during the budget process, assigned a lead department, and then identified specific outcomes uh, for them so we can track them throughout the year. Many of these projects are already underway. Uh, for example, we'll be talking about the Cal CalPERS costs a lot this evening. Um, we have an RFQ out for somebody to help us with an evaluation of our grant program. Um, the Finance Advisory Committee, I know, is already talking about some future revenue ideas that they want to explore. Mall redevelopment is, is a huge project. I think it's going to be, you know, for the Community Development Department and the City Manager's Department, one of our key focuses as we move forward into this next year. The Police Department has already done a great evaluation of our parking meter technology and its usability and I think it was a good one that Councilmember Peterson brought up because when we went and did sort of a self audit um, it seemed like there was a lot of room for improvement there and we do plan to roll that out in the near future the rec strategic plan the RFQ is out and in do we have some I think we have some middles on that one so we'll begin work on that shortly Coastal Commission uh, zoning certification for Katie's sake. We won't spend too much time talking about this evening, <laughs> but we will be talking about it at future meetings. And the cannabis uh, retail license process is moving forward, and we hope to have two potential um, licensees coming up here in the next couple of weeks that then can start working with the Planning Department and the Planning Commission on permits to uh, begin their operation. <clears throat> we talked about the Children's Fund for youth programming that's in the proposed budget. Uh, the proposed budget also out reallocated the freed up general fund uh, into the facilities fund and we'll talk about some uses for that to help improve the community center. Um, we're continuing to work with Central Fire on the lifeguard services relationship. State of the city report, this is part of that, uh, is also included in the budget message at the front of the budget. Um, we'll be talking more about the funded CIPs, the library and wharf, and then the unfunded CIPs uh, more this evening. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim to talk about the hard numbers a little bit more. Sure. So, so this slide up here is just showing our um, revenue summary by major category and the takeaway I take from this is 80% of, almost 80% of our revenues coming from taxes and about 50% of that is sales tax. So sales tax, um, like Jamie was saying earlier, we have a, a slight dip in 17, 18 where the, the state um, wasn't paying us timely and, and it goes up a little bit this year when they made up for those payments, but overall when you look at those columns, it's pretty flat for the last five years. Property tax, on the other hand, continues steady growth, as Jamie had mentioned, anywhere from about four to six percent over this time frame. And then TOT, the one bump that you do see in the 18-19 year is just with the passage of Measure J, the 1.25 percent now goes in. So without that measure J, this would be completely flat across the board as well. On the expenditure side, um, the big thing here is we're service industry. So about almost 60% of our expenditures are personnel related, which shows right here. So 66% personnel and then 20% contract services. And then the, the rest is made up by just the other small categories that are up there. 
by departments. Again, police and public works are our two biggest departments. So police is just under 48% of the budget and public works is just under 20%. And then the other 32 is the rest of the departments. <coughs> So department highlights, uh, in the city council department, we were able to reduce contract services by using some of the TOT restricted revenue that we can give to local business groups. So the uh, chamber used to be funded out of the, the $30,000 a year used to come out of city councils, now coming out of those. And then some of the regional homeless needs was funded out of the city council budget is now coming out of some of the restricted money. Uh, the other change was we added um, a couple of memberships, MBEP, the four C's and the Jet Noise Roundtable Total of those is about thirteen thousand. Th those were found in other places in the budget, so these aren't new expenditures. We just sort of realized that that's probably the the better place to put them. So the, if you see the bump in council memberships, that's what that that's attributable to. Uh, the city attorney budget really is uh, no change for this year. On the city manager budget, the big change was bringing in the information systems. Um, technician we used to contract that out that wasn't working so well for us so we brought that in and have a full-time staff now that you met a few council meetings ago Heather and then in the finance department as Jamie mentioned we're getting ready to launch our TOT and short-term vacation rental audit enforcement program for the police department their uh, highlights for this upcoming year is going to be implementation implementation of a new records management system um, completing the licensing of two retail cannabis locations and also developing the audit and inspection plan uh, expansion of the neighborhood watch program that was launched last year successfully complete training for a program for the new officers that are going through the police academy and then as jamie mentioned also assessing the parking meter program and equipment and trying to improve the user experience for public works probably the biggest as far as change is converting we had a one employee that was half-time mechanic up in the courtyard and half-time maintenance worker doing some meter maintenance and, and other maintenance work as well. He's now um, been converted to a full-time mechanic. Big projects are uh, the library and Park Avenue sidewalks, library and construction, Park Avenue's out to bid right now. Um, continued developing permitting and funding for the wharf, the Rispin Park project, and then we're gonna um, talk a little bit more about continuing efforts to complete all the funded CIP projects and then as well as doing a complete full review and evaluation of the CIP program. Community development, uh, they have a couple of big things up there. Uh, working with the mall ownership group is, is huge for us right now. Um, the two conditional use permits for the licensed cannabis retail um, stores. And then uh, Jamie already mentioned the zoning code update and submittal to the Coastal Commission for LCP certification. And then also working with uh, regional partners towards a regional bike share program. For museum, their big project for this year is digitizing media for long-term preservation to preserve those historical records. And then art and culture commission is gonna be, or is gonna be focused on public art on 41st Avenue corridor. And library. Um, for the recreation department, so this is probably where most of our changes are happening. So um, the, as Jamie mentioned, we're working on the strategic plan. We've just got the bids back or the proposals back. So we'll see what that looks like. Um, piloting a new after school program for teen and younger youth in partnership with SoCal Union. And we have some more information on that later on in the presentation. Um, growing the relationship that we started this year with Central Fire to provide lifeguard services and training for our junior lifeguard instructors working with public works to um, kind of spruce up the community center painting and a couple other smaller projects but just make it look a little more appealing and then complete an american camp accreditation process for camp capitola so as far as the new programs uh, the teen club is to provide youth opportunity to improve leadership and decision making for pro-social interests and create social emotional peer interaction and enhance life and Nikki can expand upon that because that is out of my wheelhouse. Um, and also the, the program, our plan is to have a high uh, staff to participant ratio of one staff for every 10 participants. Um, it will be located at New Brighton Middle School to enhance school connectivity and try to pick up some of the fifth graders as they come through. And then the enrollment by day is to accommodate for the um, students that are in social clubs, sports, whatever other activities, that way they can come on days that they're available. They don't 
have to register for a month at a time when they can't participate the full month. On the um, K through fifth grade, it's intended to provide an enrichment program that exposes youth to diverse recreation activities. We're still trying to um, nail down our transportation needs on that, so that'll st that, that project or program right there is still evolving as we speak right now. I want to add on this. So we, you saw the FTEs that were associated with this in the, we talked about them earlier in the budget. And one of the things that, that Nikki and I have worked on a little bit is, is that there's a balancing between those staffing positions and actual enrollment in this program. And so the, the, just so council is aware, just because we authorize the staff doesn't mean we're going to go out and hire everybody on day one. It's going to be an iterative process where we're looking at enrollments and identifying when we have the actual staff needs and figuring out a balancing between the two. Because So we don't want to <clears throat> dive into the pool before just, you know, figuring out if there's water in it. That, that was our first step. So that helps council understand. So the other new programs that we have are, is the youth program funding coming from Measure uh, J. So for this year, we're estimating about 51,500 available. 28,000, almost 29,000 of the, those dollars have already been programmed to um, existing community grants for youth programs. So that leaves about 22,800 available in this year for additional um, youth programs that we'll be um, looking for council direction on that in a couple more slides. On the capital um, improvement project front, so the two projects that, are, that we currently have going are the library, which is under construction, expected to be completed around a year from now, and then Park Avenue sidewalks out to bid. Uh, that was one that was just approved, I believe, at the last council meeting. Bids are due on June 5th, and we think it anticipate completion in end of summer, early fall this year. For Measure F, I want to give a little bit of a history on Measure F. So we're a year and a half into receiving Measure F revenue. So the column on, well, the left column is the, the projects. The second column is the budget for this year. The majority of the money is programmed to the wharf. Not quite sure how much of that will actually move forward, but that's where it's sitting right now. Um, the jetty and the flume, as you're aware, is kind of on hold as we wait for the um, outcome of the grant application. So in prior years, we've to date, we've received about 1.6 million and we've programmed or appropriated all 1.6 as listed up there with the wharf at 314, jetty at 650,000, flume at 500. We did wharf repairs the first year we had Measure F money of 47,000. And then uh, Measure F also contributed to the purchase of the beach loader, about 50% of the cost of the beach loader. And then the far right column shows what we've actually spent out of those approved appropriations. So this is a um, kind of a CIP up project update. So those first four up there, 38th Avenue sidewalks, the 2018 Slurry Seal, Jade Street Community Center, and Jewel Box are all completed. And then Public Works will be coming back next month to council to review the Jewel Box traffic calming, what the results were of the counts before and after. Um, the library is we've, and the Park Avenue sidewalks we've talked about already. Park Avenue slope repair is in review by, uh, with Caltrans right now with a budget of about 500,000 and we ex expect to construct in 2019. The, and, and that's the, the section of Park Avenue that failed when the eucalyptus fell on it. Oh. And uh, we believe that there is is uh, FEMA money, or FHWA uh, money that will pay for that. So that's, that's an improvement that we obviously need because we have the K rail up there now. <laughs> Uh, the next one up there, uh, Bromer Street Improvements is in design with an anticipated budget of 770000 We expect to start constructing next spring. Rispin Park is in design, $500,000 budget, and ex hope to start constructing fall of this year. The Monterey Park Avenue Trail is currently in review by the RTC with a $250,000 budget that we have not scheduled yet, waiting, uh, awaiting their review. The jetty and flume, as I mentioned, uh, total budget of 1.6 is on hold, awaiting the grant decision. Wharf is in design. Um, right now, we're saying six to nine million and possibly starting construction in 2021. Cap, Cap Ave, Bay Avenue, Roundabout and Underground, we're working with PG&E and AT&T right now. Budget is 45,000 and we'll get that scheduled once we get through uh, working with people, get everything worked out with PG&E and AT&T. And then 41st Avenue signal coordination working with Caltrans. There's a $400,000 grant out there. 
Um, I think it's the Airboard, yeah. Airboard grant that's, that's out there. On the uh, Equipment Fund ISF, so we're requesting four purchases this year. Uh, the first is a mini sweeper for Public Works and also a ditch witch for Public Works. Uh, the mini street sweeper is going to replace the large one or is in addition to the large one? It's replacing. So, so the street sweeper is actually represents a little bit of a different strategy that we haven't employed in the past. And historically, we've bought a new street sweeper about every five years. <clears throat> and we buy the big, heavy industrial street sweeper. <clears throat> and then the five-year-old street sweeper goes in as our backup. Um, and, and the five-year replacement cycle is pretty, pretty fast. They're pretty expensive vehicles. And it, it's driven by the amount of usage. These things are running a lot. And one of the things that Steve and I are proposing here is to get a mini street sweeper, which would be probably more appropriate for a lot of our smaller streets. Um, <clears throat> we don't necessarily need the same kind of street sweeper that you'd use up and down 41st Avenue or on Bay to try to limit the run time on the heavy duty street sweeper and then use this smaller street sweeper on, you know, in, in the neighborhoods more, uh, which hopefully then we end up with a lower sort of overall amortized cost over multiple years. So. This is a little bit of a new proposal, um, but Steve and I think that it's a, it's a good strategy to try to draw more life out of the heavy duty, bigger street sweeper, and then you know, use this mini street sweeper to, to uh, cut down on runtime. Con configuration wise, is this something similar to like what they'd use in industrial parking lots? Is it that, okay. okay. Yeah, exactly. Same operator. It, our guys operate it, our guys and gal. Uh, our guys at this stage, but our, our crew operates the street sweeper. So we don't need a new person? No. No, there's no no new licenses or certifications or a new person. Frankly, I mean, we have somebody, I think, I want to say about 30 hours a week runs the sweeper. So what they would hopefully then end up doing is, is 15 hours in the, the big one and 15 hours in the small one, and then we double the life of our, our quarter of a million dollar sweeper. That's the goal. And then the other two pieces of equipment are up there are for the police department, a uh, police sergeant vehicle, as well as a replacement police motorcycle. On the facilities fund, um, we're actually increasing funding from the general fund by utilizing some of the freed up dollars that were previously spent um, for, for on the community grant program. If we didn't have those uh, extra Measure J dollars funding that, we would have actually been decreasing our contribution to the facilities fund. So that that was pretty big help right there. So we were able to, to program 108,000. Last year we had 90,000 going in and we were bouncing back and forth as we were trying to budget the, balance the budget between 70 and 80 and then we realized that we had that. We were able to bump it up to 108. Um, and then out of that 108, we're programming about 50,000 for the community center improvements that I mentioned earlier. And we anticipate an ending fund balance on June 30th of next year of about 439,000. So for the community center improvements, right now we're targeting interior paint, um, ADA, the front door, so that they, there's a you know, button you can hit and the front door will open, um, and probably some interior furniture. You know, we're obviously trying to balance these expenditures with the fact that our lease expires, I want to say, in 13, 12 years. Um, with the school district and we've in the past indicated to them that we didn't want to make sort of heavy long-term 50-year investments in new HVACs, roofs, sewer lines, things like that. <clears throat> so we were trying to target things that were more kind of ongoing. So the interior paint, the ADA door is really something that should happen and then the furniture is obviously something that you know wouldn't be expected to have a 25-year life cycle in any scenario. How about the kitchen? I know it's sort of unfunctional and so that limits our activities we could rent it out for. Well, you're absolutely right. The kitchen is not very functional and that was actually on Nikki's first list of items to address. The challenge is, is number one is, is you start bump, bumping up against, you know, how much money do you have? And number two is, is, is if we're going to do a major kitchen renovation or do something that allows us to do more with the kitchen, how does that play in with the overall lease? So, um, the paint, the ADA front door, and the furniture seem to us like the most logical thing, but the kitchen's certainly on top of everyone's list as well. And then so, so um, we're projecting that, as Jamie mentioned, that we're gonna end this year with about $1.3 million of general fund fund balance. 
we would recommend maintaining a minimum of 800,000, which is about half a percent of our general fund. Um, and so that leaves 500,000 that could potentially be programmed into other areas. And so we put up some potential uses of what those, what we could do with the, that fund balance. And um, so one of them is obviously leave it intact for future budget shortfalls. We could deposit into the purse trust. Right now we're sitting at about 845,000 in the purse trust. We could pay down principal on the outstanding Pacific Cove debt. So that debt that was refinanced in 2012 originally had a 5.14% interest rate. When we refinanced it, it dropped to 3.25. It's gonna go back to at least 5.14 in 2022. So it, it's set to go to the greater of either the 5.14 or the US Treasury 10 year plus 3% which right now would be about five and a half, five point four percent 5.4%. So that interest rate is going to go up for sure in the next three years. Yes. What was that, what was the total amount of that loan? It is, right now the balance is 1.2 million, I believe. So by way of a little bit more background, first off, I, I, I think that the 800,000 is about 5% of the general fund, not half a percent. Oh. <laughs> um, and secondarily, so when we took out the original PAC Cove debt, this was to um, finance the closure of the park. This was to finance the closure of the park. I'm sorry, we have two pieces of debt on PAC Cove. One was to build the parking lot, one was to finance the closure. So, so this was originally, a tw it's a 20 year debt and the first 10 were fixed and then we got, went variable 10 years out. It's with Santa Cruz County Bank. And so we received settlement with our insurance brokers um, after the flood and we used that settlement money to pay down some of that debt because a lot of the debt was associated with costs that were incurred because of it. So I want to say that we have about 14 total, 16 total years of payments on that. And so we have six years where we're into the variable interest rate. So there may be an advantage to trying to work towards paying that down so we're not carrying principal into that um, variable interest rate environment starting in 2022. And then a couple other options would be to increase the deposits into the facilities reserve, or we could fund additional CIP projects or any combination of those. And just um, on the next slide, just as a reminder, when we talked about the um, CIP and the council goals, we wanted to list the projects that came up when we were going through the budget principles. So we have um, the Clare Street pedestrian improvements, Clare Street improvements near Trader Joe's, which is a traffic signal. Capitola Avenue and sidewalk uh, and retaining wall in the 300 block, Fanmar Street improvements, drainage and roadway, street improvements from City Hall to Fanmar, relocation of portable toilets at McGregor Park, and wharf improvements. And then on the kind of public works CIP wish list, we added 41st Avenue rehab, uh, citywide slurry seal, and then Ris Rispin Park. So those were uh, projects that came out of that um, Goal set the principal budget principles and goal setting as well as just kind of what we have. So tonight our next steps uh, identify any questions we can answer as many questions as you have and then um, any issues for follow up that you would like us to bring back. We'd like some direction on uses or at least start the discussion on uses for the 22,800 in youth TOT funds and then initial discussions on, on uses of the general fund balance. Um, we had a fact meeting last night and they've asked me to, to bring back some additional information before they're ready to make a uh, recommendation. So part of it was, as um, Council Member Brooks was saying, what is some more information on that loan? When does it, what, what's the balance? When does it pay off? And those good things. And then um, we'll be back on May 29th for a special council meeting to go over whatever changes we make between now and then. And that completes the presentation, and we're happy to take questions. Okay. Um, so who would like to jump in any questions of Jim and our city manager? Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation and the state of the city presentation also. Thank you. Okay, Sam, please. Oh. Thank you. Um, thank you for that overview and that presentation, Jim. Um, I guess I want to start off by asking, what's a ditch witch? 
I could take a stab at it, but I'm I not just gonna... <laughs> a ditch switch is it's a, a trade name for a piece of equipment that is a vacuum. It's a portable, a large trailer mounted vacuum. We use it to clean out our storm drain inlets, which we're required to do uh -huh. uh, every year before the rainy season, part of our stormwater program. So okay. it's called ditch switch because you can also use it for locating utilities in a roadway as part of your project. So but we use it for it. Right. Okay. Storm drain. All right. Good. Um, and also, um, I wanted to, the staff was recommending leaving eight hundred thousand of the fund balance. I was just curious why that number. Um, is, is there some logic, or is it just a comfortable number to work with? Well, I mean, I think I think the, the basic answer is it's a comfortable number to work with. I think that what we've experienced is year to year, there's obviously in a budget this size with so many things that are beyond the city's control, there's variability. And we've had years that have closed out a couple hundred thousand dollars or more the wrong direction. Um, and so this provides a little bit of cushion. Also, if there's an urgent need that comes up during the year, it's a source of funding that can be used. So there's not... We don't have a policy about maintaining a 5% fund balance. We do have policies about our reserves, emergency mm -hmm. and contingency reserve levels. I think that's just a, it's a target figure that I think we would suggest. Keep in mind that during the economic downturn, we lost, I think it was $1.8 million of sales tax over about a six quarter period as the economy tanked. So that's the scale of variability we can have, um, particularly with sales tax. The other, the other revenue streams are a little bit more predictable, but uh, that is a little bit of a buffer to help sort of manage into a downturn when it comes up. Okay, thank you. Um, and on the CIP schedule, we, there, there was a list here, and then I was wondering if we could be given, because uh, it wasn't, I didn't notice it in the notebook, uh, but the schedule of the funded portion and the uh, and the budget remaining for each of these particular projects um, as we you know attempt to evaluate them determine uh, whether we want to shift any of that um, um, fund balance into the cip so correct me if i'm wrong steve but this slide here this is the funded amount is that yeah, now I guess the wharf does not have six to nine million. So that would be the one, the one. But so for example, the roundabout, we've appropriated 45 at this point, which is really just the de yeah. design cost to get the underground and going. There's 250 for the, the Monterey Park Avenue trail to get out of Pat Cove here, mm -hmm. 500 at this point for Rispin Park. Rispin, I think we do think is probably underfunded at this point. Steve, I'll let you chime in. Yeah, I, and I was just gonna, I, add that the budget amount like on the um when jim is just looking at the um monterey rail trail or monterey park trail that is 200 200 of that is actually grant money we have from the rtc so this is a combination of money that's been budgeted over the years and i'd be you know we can certainly come back with more details on each project and what what the money is and what the remaining balance is yeah, I think before we, as we finish up, because I was unclear, we're using budgeted amount and funded amount, and in my mind, there, there's a distinction. I'm not. That's correct. Yeah, I'm yeah, not clear. Is. You know, some of those seem to be total budget cost, and right. but not necessarily defining how much we've been able to sock away to complete them. So yeah, we can come up. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll clarify that, and I think I think this list generally is what's funded, with the exception of the wharf. Um, also, um, in the report and in the pro forma budget, uh, the city attorney is uh, flat funded. I is that um, pursuant to recent developments? Is that still a good uh, uh, estimation? Um, and I'll just leave the question there, um, and maybe you could bring it back to us at a future date in the appropriate setting. When, when is it anticipated that the cannabis tax, um, are, well, when will the permit, when will the stores actually open so that the tax will start, will start to be generated? 
So it's a little bit outside of the city's control to some degree. We, we anticipate issuing our preliminary award, which is basically the top two, top two uh, of the 14 applicants that we got. Um, <clears throat> I wanna say in the next two weeks, so then at that point, they have six months to get their land use permits from the planning department and from the right. planning commission. Yeah. So if they're diligent, I would expect that they, and they have leases in place, which I know some of them do, they may be able to move relatively quickly and get in front of the planning commission and get their permits and get themselves open. Like I said before, this budget is anticipating six months of revenue from two. So that would mean them opening by January 1st, 2020. Okay. Um, which I think is a reasonable timeline to get from A to B, but obviously if somebody gets an initial award and then can't get a lease, uh, it throws a wrinkle in those, in those projections. Alternatively, um, the numbers I think I'm hoping are a little bit low, and so it's possible that you know either one or even if it was for one was only open for three months, that the budget uh, number is attainable. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and I think that's a realistic assumption. I was just, you know, curious about what we were assuming for yeah. budgeting purposes um, of the revenue. Um, and the other, on the uh, on the revenue side, once again, under property taxes um, and vehicle motor in lieu, um, we're projecting uh, like a 6.6% .6 increase. Uh, and I was... Yeah, uh, well, that's part of the property tax. So are we still optimistic that uh, the property tax um, revenues are going to increase themselves four and a half yeah, percent? I, I think that the county gave us a, a, a little bit of a low estimate last year. So the 6.46 is an increase over last year's budget. It's about four and a half percent over what we actually received this year, which is the information I got from the county this year. Mm -hmm. Okay. But are we seeing that? Is that strictly based on um, turnover um, or activity in the market? Um, because it doesn't seem that that prices are are you know, increasing any further. No, I I would assume it's turnover. So you have two drivers of that. One is is just the two percent Prop Thirteen, mm -hmm. and then the other driver is turnover. Mm -hmm. So. You know, you see about, you know, 2% is what, in theory, if nothing sold or was reassessed in the city or was built, that's what we would see. Um, and then all, secondarily is the turnover. Uh, and that's the, the 4.5, I think we're pretty confident in that 4.5 figure for next year. Of all of our revenue projections, that's probably one that we're the most comfortable with. So were you think. okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the most stable in terms of, you know, the parking citations, the TOT, the sales tax, those are the ones uh, that, um, yeah. are harder to predict. I'll, um, I'll rely on that optimism then. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> or, or worry about the other ones more. How about that? <laughs> um, those, are, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Kristen? Yeah, I have one. Um, some of my questions were already answered in the presentation, or, or Sam beat me to it. Um, but one that I have is in regard to our uh, teen club program through recreation. I think it's a great idea, especially to uh, identify the kinds of youth that would want to be involved in our uh, boards and commissions that we have seats for youth now. Um, one of the things I'm curious about, though, is that with the enrollment by day model and the idea that we're going to have um, the uh, em employment based on enrollment, my question would be, what would our plan be if no one shows up on any given day? Is this going to become an on-call position, assuming that someone shows up? or, or um, if it's enrollment by day and no one enrolls for any given day, are we paying someone to essentially sit in a room by themselves? I see. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, enrollment by day would be that I'm going to sign up for Mondays. Oh, I see. Okay. And then I'm going to sign up for Tuesdays. So that way within each month of the program or by session is kind of the model I'm thinking about going with. So that the idea is that on Mondays, is the days that we're going to do archery for teen club and that's going to have a six-week session so for that six-week session we will have a group of participants that will sign up for those mondays and then we know how to staff that based on the enrollment perfect thank you yeah. oh that was it 
Yeah, thank you. I have a couple of questions. <laughs> I don't believe <laughs> um, Going back to the transient occupancy tax, it looks like it flattens out on your bars on page 10 of our packet there. Um, is the increase from 10 that we went, that was voter approved from 10 to 12% reflected here? Yeah, that was, that's the jump right there. That's that, the little, okay. So from 17, 18 to um, actual to the 18, 19 adopted, that's the amended adopted is the 1.25% of the okay. general fund portion. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I just was looking for some clarification on we have a couple, three different or four different reserves. So we have the emergency reserve, contingency reserve, PERS contingency reserve, and then facilities reserve. And from your recommendations on how to utilize the fund balance, you mentioned the facilities reserve. I, what I'm trying to figure out is the differences between, and I know there's, it explains it here, but it, they just sound really similar, the emergency reserve and the contingency reserve together as a whole, and then the facilities reserve. Um, and I just wrote down a question, it's like what is considered or considered a major repair? Because if we had a major repair like Pat Cove, for instance, that was pulled out of our contingency reserve, our emergency reserve, and it just seems that it kind of falls into all the same place. So when we're thinking about allocating, the, allocating those dollars, I'm just trying to think of the least restrictive reserve we have and if there's any reason behind that. So um, for restrictive, really reserves are, are designated by council. So the council as a group could, could redesignate how right. those funds are. It would take a, a majority vote. Um, emergency reserve is really kind of just for emergencies where contingency reserve is kind of your operating ups and downs. So if you're in a downtime, you may pull from that contingency and then when it's up, you put it back. Emergency would be more like the storm drain from 2011. Mm -hmm. On the facilities reserve, and we were talking a little bit about this this afternoon, when we did the um, evaluation in 2014, the recommendation was two to 4% of our replacement value, which at that time was 17 and a half million. So that would be anywhere from 350 to 700,000 budgeted every year into that to cover the major repairs that you're talking about. We don't have that kind of funding, so we've never funded at that level. Right. That helps. A couple other points, I think. The, the one is, is that we use the word PERS trust fund. That's the same as this PERS contingency reserve. They're the same thing. The trust fund, why we call it a trust fund is because it's actually held by a uh, third party, and it actually, we are, by putting it in the trust fund, we're allowed to invest it in um, higher risk type in, uh, investments to get a longer, to get with a longer investment portfolio to get a higher uh, rate of return in it. So we do talk about putting funding into both of those, either the purse contingency or the facilities reserve. And the logic behind not putting more into the contingency or emergency reserve is, you know, primarily driven by the fact that we have a policy funding level on those. Mm -hmm. That you know, we say we're going to have. 10% and 15% in those funds. Um, and so there is, in a sense, whether it's actually more restricted than the PERS reserve or the uh, facilities reserve, there's more of a more restricted in that sense. Maybe it's more politically restricted. Right, I under, yeah. It just, um, okay, so somewhere in here you mentioned that you are uh, that one of the recommendations is to move 55,000 to the emergency contingency reserve is that correct was that insight it was in so, the budget so under the policy we have the 10% um, to emergency and 15% contingency mm -hmm. right now based on what the balances are in those reserves and what our proposed budget is they'll be underfunded if we don't add so it, I think we need 25 to the emergency and 30 Okay. to the contingency, if I have that right, to get them funded at the proper right. level. I think that's so the only, the only only reserve we're not backfilling is the facilities reserve. If we don't do anything, so it's just the emergency and contingency that we're backfilling 
out of all the reserves. Okay. Yes. Um, and, and we have an allocation to the facilities. We have the 108 proposed to go into the facilities reserve in this budget. Right, right, right. Yeah. Got that. And, and uh, the 55,000 that I'm talking about for the two reserves is already out of that 1.3 million. Right. Um, and then the uh, regarding the children's fund, just a little note. I just want to make sure that we say early ed and youth programs because there's two very different things mm -hmm. um, and that's not reflected in the budget um, and then in addition to that we you were mentioning the 22,000 for 1920 are we anticipating the same amount for 2021 I couldn't really figure that out from the budget because the decisions we make today for 1920 you know, decisions could, we make today are for 1920 you know when you look at 2021 it comes down to growth in TOT. Um, you know, if we can see growth in TOT, then there will be more in 2021. Well, but from what I see, it's going to be the same amount of TOT for 2021. And so if we just kept everything as is and funded the, from the, the, the groups, they're already the 13,000, would it be safe to say that 22,000 approximately would be the remainder in the dedicated children's fund? For I think that's a safe estimate. I, I, I would, you know, just when we look at our revenue assumptions, particularly for the more volatile revenue sources, whether it's TOT or sales tax, the one thing I can tell you is, is that we're not going to get it exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> Invariably, you know, we can project a 1% growth and we'll see 3% growth or we'll see half a percent. So at this point, you know, it's kind of like the finger in the wind. It's probably where we think it's going to be, but but it'll probably be a little bit different. Well, one of council's goals or our intentions were to use one-time funding on one-time things. And so when I'm looking at that $22,000, I just want to be mindful that it's we're ongoing. funding. Yeah, that's ongoing. Right, okay. So, and just what will, would, what will be available next year will be dependent on what how the community grant program plays out. Right, do we have, um, a timeline on that I know the RFP went out do we know when the deadline for completion for that is oh Larry stepped out he's, well, he's the timing the, is great no, he's doing that camera stuff oh um I I don't know so I think I think we're gonna hoping to get somebody on board here before the end of the fiscal year and then start the process this summer and then going back to the TOT and the budget it's um it separates the BIA Capitola Village so it says TOT and then it few lines down it says BIA um, chamber on the revenue summary under under summary information Uh, summary information in our budget oh. under revenue summary. So, are you? I guess we need page numbers, huh? <laughs> That'd be nice. <clears throat> under special special revenue funds. Oh, interesting. So I've noticed that they're separated, and I was curious why. So that, that's, that's a mistake. So look, we have, we have this. Oh, there's expenditures. This is some of those revenue, and it's like she's on this side. I mean, it's actually on every page. So if you continue through the revenue summary expenditure, so, I mean, it right, reflects. Right. So, so keep in mind the BIA, Capital Village, Wharf BIA, that figure, that's the BIA revenue. The hundred and four thousand. No, it's uh, we're project. Yes, the hundred and four. That's exactly. That's right. their total revenue with their assessments of about seventy-five thousand. So under the TOT restricted revenue, what's the difference? So what we did was we set up a special revenue fund for restricted TOT money. So all restricted TOT money will come into that fund, and then from there we will either pay directly to youth programs in the grant programs. We will pay directly to the chamber or we transfer down to the BIA because the BIA already has their own fund, special revenue fund for their assessments. So it's a little bit funky in that some of it shows 
as revenue going in one area and then it's not really revenue to the BIA, it's more of a transfer that's approved by council. But they still have another $75,000 of assessment revenue that they program as well. So the, the trick is, is to think a little bit like a government finance person, that if you take money from this pot and you put it here, you get money in this pot and then when you move it over here, you also get money over there. So it's hard to get your head around because it looks like it, effectively it's being double counted, if that makes sense. It's not double counted in, in the budget in terms of our overall numbers, but when you look at the totals, going from fund to fund. when yeah, money moving from fund to fund looks like revenue when from a logical layperson standpoint, you may not think of it as both numbers are just accurate, but it's not. They're accurate, but it's it's hard to get your head kind I of around, it. I think. I yeah, if, if, if that helps. So the BIA BIA, Capital of Village Wharf, BIA, that line that shows up in the special revenue funds, that includes both the money that they The 30,000 from the above line already in there. And the, the BIA assessment. And their, uh, their, their funds, got it. Right. Okay. Um, and then you mentioned the impact on for the mall revitalization. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. Um, and maybe this is just for, for it's just a comment um, that maybe that's worth working with the mall on you another on your wish list of cip projects was the 41st ave i mean it's worth the conversation to have who knows maybe they'll pay for it but um and and that could be a role of ours as well to to talk to them about that in the future i, I think that's a great point i mean i do think that it's very typical for large-scale projects like this to include some off-site improvements and those could be some that we would be working through them working with them through the course of the entitlement process and in addition, you know, I, I meant to say it earlier this evening, but I think, you know, I spend all this time sort of beating on the, the dangers of sales tax and our over-reliance on sales tax. And I think that the mall project is one that we need to have some real conversations with the developers and as a council about is, is there other ways to diversify the revenue stream off that project when it's done? You know, does it need to be at this point, you know, the mall is essentially other than business licenses is a hundred percent sales tax generator. Um, and when it's done, could it be, still a revenue source for the city but you know potentially generating other kinds of revenue for us whether it's tot or um you know some sort of special tax there's there's a number of different options that we can look at through the process and, and then my last comment is regarding the after school um pilot i just want to uh the original vision that i had um i would just stress that it's really important that we consider ensuring that this program is for all students, all kids in in the area. And so moving forward, I know there's a definition here, but I don't know if that's, um, that's exactly what I was envisioning. And I just hope that we can keep that in mind that it's a, con my idea was that it would be a continuous after school program for the students to attend um, and that it would be partially funded by the dedicated children's fund, but also in partnership with um, with the school district so we can offer low income, um, lo offer it for free to low income families and so forth. So it's not just completely fee based. So just something that I wanted to put out there. Is that something you mentioned the children's fund? Is that something we can come back with a scholarship program or something? Is that you know, I, from what I understand, it's at the early stages, since it's a pilot program, um, that there are a lot of community partners, such as the school district, United Way, that could also offer some of these opportunities. So, um, you know, I, that's probably, that could be an, an, op an option, but I just don't know. Again, it's the foundationally what it is, um, it, it sounds like it's it's moving a lot of steps ahead and again I just want to make sure that it's clear what the, the model is before we we move forward with approving it so would it be helpful for us to come back at the next budget hearing with more about the model would that be I would appreciate that yeah that's all thank you okay. sure um, I think it's important to, to recognize, you know, by reading through this, you know, we are in a lot of transition. I, you know, especially when I looked at public works, you know, we, we've gone from the full-time superintendent to the field. There's, so it's hard to get a, a figure on how the budget works out on, on the annual basis. And I, I recognize in a lot of departments, I'm finally feeling after a lot of department head replacements and, and other things that we were very stable now going into this year, at least with our personnel. So it'll be easier to evaluate all these departments. 
On uh, to Sam's point, you know, when we were, when we look at this, I mean, I appreciate the uh, the accounting, and I know that uh, from, from your perspective, this all is is crystal clear to you. But for us, sometimes, for for me, when I'm sitting up here, we're right now trying to figure out that we've got this supposed excess money we want to allocate, and the helpful thing is, which I think you're going to bring back to us, is we need to know, you know, if we're going to try to allocate some money to something, how much is already in there, you know, like for our facilities fund. For example, you know, because there was talk at one time about, you know, how we're going to improve that, and then apparently our lease thing is not stable at the school district, so it's kind of hard to commit to putting more money in there doing that. But on all these things, you know, it, it, it'd be nice for me to look at it and say, because my recollection right now is I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like this time last year, we were talking about the RISPIN, and, and you can maybe go back and look this up for me, but I thought we were thinking, well, RISPIN's funded, but we think we put, I think my memory says we put more money in there last year because we didn't want it to fall short. And then now again we're here and it's, we want more money because we think it's going to be short. And I'm thinking, I don't know that it's short. I think that maybe Steve might be cluing us to us like Park Avenue and uh, uh, Claire's. These projects doubled over time because what we thought was enough to do something is not enough to do those projects. And I don't know if that's part of why you hinted that you might like another 250000 for the RISPIN because you don't think we're going to get it done for what we had. Because I remember last, I think my recollection is that we did put money into the RISPIN last year just to, we, so we wouldn't be short, and apparently that's what I'm, what I'm perceiving. So like I said, when you come back, just let us know how much money we actually have in that fund and, and, and what your best guess estimate is next to it. You know, if you think the RISPIN is going to be 800000 and we only have five hundred, then that means we're short three, and that's what we need to know because... You know, we're sitting here trying to figure out we have one point, apparently $559,000 to play with now by my best guess if we if we decide to, to allocate that. Uh, the other area that, that I had concern on was um, this, our, our parking and citations. You know, I mean, it, it's a major source of our revenue and I think we, we danced around it a little bit, but over the past two years, we had significant um, Illness, injury, lack of full people on the street, lack of a complete revenue. I mean, and it's it's between the two of them, it's about $1.2 million, and they both suffer when we don't have those people out there. And I know, that for I'm reading it now, is I, I know there was a 50% uh, public works guy that was going to be the 50% repair meter guy, and now he's fully into public works. So who's repairing the meters? Is that back on the uh, public works is going to be repairing the meters? Okay, so the the two point five. I'm going to call it. Well, in the book, in the thing, it says two went from three FTA to two FTA, and then we have a 990 hour, which is the part time person, Gabe, for lack of a better term. Um, I, I I'm just wondering. I'm wondering. I guess I want to hear that you, that you feel that if all those people are actually there and we don't have the injuries and th that that is adequate to secure our revenue and citations from parking and citations. I guess that's what I'm wanting to hear. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. I, I do believe that you, you touched on it, uh, council member uh, Bottorf, that we had during the peak season of the year, this current year, um, a shortage of our two parking service officers due to injuries, um, about two and a half months worth. And that, and that had the most significant impact on our revenues. Uh, absent that, it, and they're healthy now, and right. good luck. If we have those two parking service officers and Gabe as our 990 or 900 officer. That is the staffing number that makes me comfortable as a police chief that we have the personnel available and working to manage that part of the program. In addition to uh, Steve's employee who helps out on a half-time basis maintaining the systems and the parking meters and the, and the pay stations. It sounded like a good plan and I'm, I'm optimistic that if we have a full year, like you say, that it would be prosperous. I think there is upside on, on especially the uh, yeah, I, I know that when we went from the two hour to three hour, there was a drop in the citations, but I think that the stability of that, that probably will go up a little bit when we have people out there on the street. So I'm, thank you for that reinforcing that. Yes, I, I appreciate that. And the last one is, is you touched on it briefly, this city council memberships. There was an increase from, I wanna say 28,000 to 35,000, is that about right? And, and you, you, there were three things there that were in the, I, I wrote them down. One was e, BP, EC, CCC, and then the uh, the Jet Sky thing. I think those are the three memberships that we were on. I 
wrote them down on one. Oh, here we go. MBEP. Oh, there we go. There we go. Can you tell me what those first two are? So MBAP, uh, we joined, I want to say, about five years ago. It's Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. It's a you know, regional, tri-county nonprofit that's trying to sort of grow regionally, do economic development. Um, Bud Colligan, who you may know, it was the founder of that. Um, the Four C's is the Central Coast. The cost of that? Five. Five. Five thousand. Okay, great. It's the Four C's is the Central Coast Climate Compact. Is that correct? Collaborative. Collaborative. And we took that to council at some point a couple of years back to about joining. And then the membership on that is about five, about five as well. The Jet Noise Roundtable, I want to say about three. Mm -hmm. Sounds about right. Okay. Um, I know that, uh, that 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 I weighed in on on suggesting that we join that, but I also weighed in with it saying I'm going to join. We're going to go for a year, and if I don't find it fruitful, we're not going to continue. And so, I'd like to get some feedback, whoever is involved, about the fruitfulness of our ten thousand dollars in those two. I don't know if that would be through you or through somebody else, but the other two, just curious. I think the mayor has been the primary contact, at least for the four C's. MBAP, I. Uh, you know, I attended a couple of their workforce committees early on and, and realized that it probably wasn't a huge value for me to attend their, their subcommittees. Um, so I haven't been an active participant individually. I don't think at the staff level we have. So I think it would be a question for council as if council is, you know, utilizing or participating in any of the MBAP um, well, I activities. won't take any more time. I'll, I'll go ahead and talk to the mayor on that and, and get an update from him. That's all I got. So um, just to follow up on what Yvette said, um, I campaign on youth activities also, and I agree. Um, I want after-school activities so that, like when I was um, faced with uh, my daughter coming home from school, where did she go? And that was a huge burden on us, uh, having a safe place and also having a place where um, the kid could be doing activities I thought was fruitful for her at school, et cetera. Um, so I campaigned on this before I saw the, the new direction of our Park and Rec program. And I'm very pleased that uh, we have new energy. And so I think I probably agree with you. I'd like to see what the program is envisioned and um, how it's moving along. Um, and then um, what I thought before the election is definitely different than what I think right now. So. I welcome, you know, a presentation on the program and to see what we're dealing with. Okay. Because so I'd like to support the activity as it is now. So I have a few questions. I am scared, so you'll see some of my uh, questions are going to deal with this, about our economic uh, future that we're tied to. We're sort of being driven by what's surrounding us. So um, the delta percent in the UAL, basically how much more we've been charge for the unfunded liability has gone up over, what, 140 percent or something like that. It's huge. That's in the last eight years. So if we're going to have um, an economic downturn, we're going to have to respond to that because that UAL will go up again. So how soon do we know how fast does PERS respond to the economic climate? I, I know they do smoothing in their projections. so. I'd like to know how much time do we have to respond when we see what's happening and then we know they're going to respond. PERS issues their um, actuarial reports each August. So okay. we'll get a report this August and it'll go through June 30th of 2018. So mm -hmm. we have about 15 months if we're tracking what the economy is doing and what PERS investments are doing. We'll know about 15 months, 12 to 15 months ahead of time which direction that should go. But there's a caveat to that is that's just on the investment side. There's probably a hundred different assumptions in there that they can make as far as uh, life expectancies, general health, um, the makeup of, of the age of the groups that are in there. So it's hard to know um, exactly when it's going to change. So when we get ours for August, it will be for next year. But yeah, w probably in reality we get about six months. Okay, so that's, that's a pretty tight um, city manager. Excuse me. The, the other thing about CalPERS is 
keep in mind, they probably, I would criticize them to some degree for this, but they're very, they like to phase things in okay. over an extended period of time. And at times that ends up meaning that we end up paying more because for example, there's still, this UAL is phasing in the investment losses from 2011, 2011 2010. Hmm. So, they, they try not to change too much based on year-to-year -year fluctuations in the market, and they try to smooth it out over time. So we have this forecast, and this forecast has proven relatively accurate for the last four years, I would say. They've been marching along pretty close to what their forecast has been. Now, the economy has been humming. So, in fact, some of these numbers have actually gotten a little bit better um, with some of the returns we've seen. I think the, mm -hmm. the, the 2.3 and Fiscal year 24, 25 was 2.5 2. 5 last, 2. last year. So <clears throat> there is a smoothing. And so even if, you know, even if there's an economic shock, you know, we have some lead time with our actuarial and then they phase these things in over time. So there's time to plan, but, you know, it's hard to plan for these kinds of increases regardless of how much time you have. I see a question from Sam. Yeah, on that. And um, one, what uh, population do they use to hmm. determine our actuarial liability? Is it discrete to uh, our staffing? It is. Okay. And could we see, or at least I would like to see a copy of last August report? Yeah, I can get it. On yeah. that? Yeah. They're, they're available online, but I, I'll send you that. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. So the actual report doesn't actually pull out our employees, but it is. It's discrete to our employees. And that's actually a change from um, how it used to be. We used to be pooled, it was called, yeah, with a bunch right. of other small size cities. Uh, unfortunately, when we got unpooled and they actually did an actuarial for our employees and our retirees, the news got significantly worse. worse. So. <laughs> we actually benefited from the pooling substantially. Um, well, I guess, and maybe I'll follow up with this, but if they don't, uh, in the report, if they don't discreetly identify um, our staffing, um, how do they come up with our um, independent uh, unfunded liability? So the report is public, it's on the internet, um, and it does break out, <clears throat> the, probably the closest it comes is to breaking out the accrued unfunded liability associated with retired employees for the city and active employees for the city. So you can see those two numbers, and most of it actually is retirees at this point. There's a um, relatively smaller portion of the unfunded liability is attributable to people that are still working for the city at this point. Um, but, so the actual spreadsheet, if you will, where they have an employee with how much they're getting and what their life expectancy <coughs> is and everything else, uh, that isn't part of that report. That's the back of house stuff mm -hmm. that we don't, we don't frankly see. So is the issue though, is it longevity um, or is it um, um, earnings um, or a combination of the two? I would guess combination. Okay. Earnings, yeah. earnings seems to impact when they have a good year. We will see it come down a little, mm -hmm. not as much as you would expect. If if their target is seven or seven and a quarter, and they're earning eleven or twelve, you would expect a big dip, and we don't necessarily. So see they that. smooth it out over. When uh, as you mentioned, yeah. When I was talking to our new auditors last year, the partner there said that he had gone through and done some uh, auditing of Calpers actuarial reports and saw a big variance in life expectancy. He said he saw some folks that had a life expectancy of like 110 years. Hmm. And when he questioned it, and he said, well, there'll be medical advancements and people will start living that long. So they, they play a lot of games with a lot of different assumptions. Now, well, we can only hope. At, at, the, li at the library board, uh, the finance director for the library is actually um, Marcus Pimentel for the city of Santa Cruz. So we, they, they do the work on contract for the library board. He was presenting the budget this year to the library board and he was saying that based on his analysis, he believed that if CalPERS had actually just got index fund returns since 2011, that they would be 100% funded today. And um, I followed up with him afterwards because that was a pretty, pretty bold statement and he talked to me a little bit, but I didn't see a lot of the backup. So. That question of what's driving the unfunded liability, is it changes in assumptions? Because they've changed assumptions. They've changed what they call their discount ratio, which is their assumed returns over time. The lower the discount ratio, they used to be at seven and three quarters. They're going down to seven here shortly. 
um, maybe they should be at five, but every time they bring that number down, it grows the unfunded liability. Every time you assume someone's gonna live longer, it grows the unfunded liability. Um, conversely, if you get returns that are better than your discount ratio, your unfunded liability should shrink. So all of these things factor in and play, play a part of the picture, but for sure, CalPERS's returns have not worked in our favor in the last, since, you know, since 2008. Well, if you could, I, I mean, I would like as much information as you could uh, provide me to, you know, be able to uh, study that issue and determine whether or not we need to increase our PERS, uh, you know, trust account. So, Absolutely. thank you. Um, just before you move on, Mayor, to finish answering your question, they also provide a five-year projection in that CalPERS report, in the actuarial report, and their projections for the f next year are generally pretty good. So like this year I have what it's gonna cost this year and their projection for next year, and that's usually pretty close. It's when they get out into years three, four, and five that it starts moving around, which is this year we saw a $200,000 decrease in the fifth year. It could change next year depending on how their investment earnings are. So we do have kind of a, a five-year projection which we build into our model as well. And they actually show it um, based on different returns. Yep. Right? They do so, you know, they'll show with you if they get underperform, you know, what, what your UAL will look like over that five year period if they overperform. Okay. So, I know that, uh, UAL is going to go up, but I feel a little bit better that we have um, some sort of um, warning about how the, cha uh, how the change in the UAL is going to go so that the city could respond and we don't have to abruptly change course. We could actually plan for things. Um, I note in your presentation that the workers at Capitola have um, been following um, good work procedures and workman's comp has gone down because of that. I, I thank you very much. And I also know from the budget that um, overtime, which I think police department is largely figuring in that, has also gone down. So my kudos to everyone on staff. Um, also, I notice in the budget you anticipate a drop in sales tax when the work on the mall starts. So I asked you in the hall about this, so I'll bring it here in the public. I was thinking that we could start slowly setting aside money in a special fund to deal with that, what we know is going to happen. So just like in the UAL, if we have a sense that it's going to happen, then we can plan for it. Uh, we already know. Um, depending on work's going to start at the mall, that we're probably going to get a drop in sales tax. So, you know, maybe that idea can be developed uh, and brought to the board here, and we could get a sense of if that's something for us to work on. So, um, in terms of cannabis, we have you made a statement, uh, city manager, about the approval process, and I think it's a two-step approval process. So the police is working on that. And reviewing it and I appreciate that because we want to get the best choices possible but also isn't California state involved to some extent it's Mr. not just us is, is Mayor, it? That, that's correct so the six-month window from when we give them their preliminary approval is to obtain all their permits necessary to begin operations and that includes the land use and building permits necessary for us to issue locally but as well they also have to get their uh, state licenses okay um, Chief, is this something that you know about because within your experience at all and like you're going to be choosing the best guys, po uh, the best companies possible and uh, the vetting is probably going to make it easier for the state to approve them, but do you have a sense of what we can expect? Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the police chief alone is not going to make the selection of the two cannabis retail. I, I know, you, but you're part of, you're <coughs> driving it, sorry. Um, with regard to the state, um, city manager is, is um, accurate in that they have um, the requirement is that they get their state license in, in conjunction with the local uh, CUP before they can operate. Mm -hmm. um, the state on that topic, the state is one year ago I would not have suggested to our council that the state is necessarily efficient in that regard. Uh, they're a whole lot more efficient now because of some of the progress that they've made. So I'm comfortable that if the applicant uh, has the proper um, filings with the state that it that it should be a, a relatively efficient turnaround for that permitting um, in conjunction with our own local permitting. With regard to the process, um, as you mentioned, it's, it's a two-part process. 
uh, Captain Daly um, just took the lead uh, internally on uh, evaluating the 14 applications. That was not an in-person evaluation, that was a, a, a methodical evaluation of the applications alone with two counterparts, one from uh, our partners in HDL and one from a local Santa Cruz County uh, expert in the industry. So that was a, the first part of the process. Uh, the next part of the process is an in, in-person in um, uh, interview or we will receive a presentation from the six finalists, uh, six finalists of the 14 total. Uh, that will happen within the next week or so and we hope to be able to make a determination of the two that will go forward to the CEP process uh, at that point. And so I'm comfortable with our process. I'm comfortable with my role as a chief of police here and understanding that process and that we will uh, hopefully uh, select the two uh, licensees that are um, viable, um, good partners in the community and are able to generate the revenue uh, under the uh, cannabis retail uh, licensing process that, that we would project. And I'm happy to answer further questions about the cannabis licensing, uh, kind of the state of the industry locally or, or, or uh, within the state, or questions specific about the process, if you'd like. Question? No, I, I wanted to hear from you uh, that you're comfortable with the process. And uh, my sense is that there was some uncertainty in the approval process, and you've answered my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Um, before you leave, <laughs> um, I'm very excited about the um, Neighborhood Watch program and I hope in the future we can get uh, a report on that because um, I think that's very good for the safety of Capitola and the interaction between the people who live here and our police department. It's only going to make things better. We are excited as well. We, are, we just scheduled our fourth uh, Neighborhood Watch meeting in a couple of weeks and so the community is becoming interested. We, I think that we're being effective and getting information out to the neighborhoods, generating some interest via next door, via uh, uh, walking through the neighborhoods. Uh, we've made a, a good amount of progress over the last year. There's more progress to make, but uh, I would look forward to the opportunity to come back to council and, and provide a presentation as to the status of Neighborhood Watch. I think Thank it's you. a good idea. Appreciate that. So I have a question for our Recreation Department directors. Excuse me, Director. <laughs> you got me on that the first time. So. I notice you're, you're seeking an accreditation, and yeah. I'm wondering what that all means. Are, are we going to be um, viewed better? Are we going to be more um, apt to get grants, or uh, why did you do this? Okay, yeah. Um, so the American Camp Association is a national organization that provides a set of professional standards and best practices for camps to um, kind of measure themselves by, and so the accreditation process is reviewing each aspect of your business as a camp and trying to meet those best practices. And then through written documentation and on-site visitation while camp is in operation by volunteers who also are in the business and are familiar with the standardized, the standard process, they come and they view your camp and assure that you are actually achieving all of those standards that your camp is um, fitting those best practices and in a way turning around and saying to the community that anybody that has an ACA accredited stamp with their camp that, that parents and families can trust that that camp is providing a good, safe, and progressive program for their camp or for their, for their youth. Um, and so I'm hoping to bring that process to Camp Capitola in order to do just that, ensure that we have best practices and that we are providing a safe and progressive program for our youth. Okay, because I remember when the, my wife and I were trying to figure out if Camp Capitola is a place for our daughter and we were both at work because we're a two working family. <laughs> And um, so we're very concerned about that. So I think yeah. this should help uh, people who are considering Camp Capital. I think this, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. So um, the roundabout, this is for Steve, the roundabout's been on forever. And uh, <laughs> how 
much more are we going to be waiting for PG&E to really give us, and I know there's an accumulation of funds that go into the undergrounding, but how so really PG &E close is are actually we? Uh, done probably 30% of the design work. Um, and at this point, we've run into a, another delay is trying to get AT&T to participate in ah, it. Okay. So the whole undergrounding thing is, yeah, PG&E will do the design, but they don't necessarily bring along AT&T with them. We've met, had a meeting with AT&T. They are, um, it looks like we're gonna have to readopt a, a undergrounding resolution for, to make them become a participant in this. Okay. Um, talking with other jurisdictions, the undergrounding projects are, um, take about three times longer than you think they ever would. And unfortunately, we're kind of in that holding pattern right now. Okay. So this is basically our service providers are not working well with us. <laughs> okay. They have their, they have separate, separate priorities than we do. I'll yes, put it I, that way. I can understand. Okay. Thanks. Cause I often get that question. Thank you. Um, I should have asked you to stay up. Um, in terms of the street sweeper, um, I often see the street sweeper go up and down and no one moves their car and everything seems to be still underneath the wheels of the car. So is there any thought about having some sort of moving of the cars on a regular basis so we could do that? It happens in most major cities so the streets are clean. And I understand we get the money for the street sweeping because we don't want the residue to go in the drain during the winter. So I don't know if there's an option You're right, here. larger cities do it. Don't park on the side of the street every Wednesday and things like that. Um, it would be a, quite a big effort to institute that. Um, I think it would um, impact our residents greatly to move cars around. It's something we could certainly look at. Um, we'd have to really get in there and redefine um, our street sweeper routes and trying to find, because you have to have them give them one day on one side and one day on the other. Right now we're just up and down a street in a day. Yes, we're in and out, but we, we try and vary it so hopefully cars move, but that's certainly something we could look at. Um, How do people know when the street sweeper is gonna come? They know just by living there. I mean, it's the same day of the week, usually around the same, same time. It's every other week for uh, the uh, residential streets and, um, and we get a lot of calls and we're the street sweeper today, so I know people know. Mm. Okay, we'll worry about that one later. Thank you very much. In terms of the uh, rail trail, um, so I'm a little surprised. I thought this is an RTC project and, well, maybe Steve, you're also gonna answer this. Um, so why are we putting money into this? I thought this was... Um, so this is a connection from the upper Beach and Village parking lot up to Monterey and then an improvement of that empty uh, piece of property next to the rail track at Park Avenue in Monterey. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a, it's a very small portion of the rail trail and of the $250,000 or you know, $250,000 $200, of that is from the RTC and uh, 50,000 of it was uh, kind of a matching fund that we have uh, with it. Um, so it was because it's a benefit to us to get people part of it is on our parking lot and going up to the to the uh, rail trail itself it's a very small section of the rail trail that's getting built as part of this okay so I stood out um, you know I think I agree there is a benefit because I've stood out in the parking lot many times and asked residents why are you walking up the hill <laughs> and cars are coming in and out and stuff like that and they prefer to go up the driveway and start down to the village uh, at the top of Monterey. So I think, in fact, you're right that, you know, it'll take people off the driveway when cars are Absolutely. coming in and out. I think that's how we identified it. But but it's being treated at the RT cell, and I'm not blaming them for this, as a part of a, you know, a full rail trail project. Or we're, right now we're stuck trying to get agreements to go in there and do some environmental st studies to see what, you know, how much arsenic there is on there. And they're holding us up to see what kind of right of way and insurance certificates we're required to have. So it's just it's being treated as a big project, even though it's a small project. Okay. It's been going on for so many years. Yeah, by way of background, this project was <clears throat> actually the first step of it. So what this project was really intended to do, as our public works director said, was <clears throat> get people in and out of Pat Cove less awkwardly. And the first phase of it was what we did here to get out of the upper lot 
the sidewalk that we put in if you're walking down the hill right. on the left hand side and that's what we wanted to do going up to monterey that would have been a much simpler alternative is just get a sidewalk in we would have had it up years ago um the problem is there's just not enough width and steve and i were out there multiple times measuring and squinting and measuring again and trying to figure out some way to do it and we realized the only logical answer was to take people up to the train tracks and then have a head along the train tracks little did we know how challenging it was going to be to get that done because then it becomes an RTC rail trail project which has a whole host of other issues rather than just being a simple sidewalk so the intent behind it is to find a safe way for people to get out of the upper lot going to the east um, that's the goal okay and I know there are other issues that are somewhat contentious but I do want to emphasize that it is a safety issue and especially at night this might be beneficial I don't know if we're going to provide lights for night but um, I agree that it is a safety issue Thank you very much. Sure. Um, so I notice we're budgeting an anticipated revenue from the cannabis uh, operations. Um, is the sense of what might happen to the former OSH store something that we could treat in the same way because so that is part of the reason why, you know, even though it looks like we have a sales tax decrease, th that sales tax estimate was is a, we think about a hundred thousand dollars better than <clears throat> we did this year our mm -hmm. best guess and that's taking into account the retenanting of the OSH store it, do, it does okay it wasn't mentioned so I just had to ask that okay so if there is a downturn you, you were talking about property taxes fairly stable and goes up two percent because of prop 13 but also if there is a downturn folks tend to get their property reevaluated. I forget there's a um, proposition that allows that to happen. Um, okay. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I forget the name of the proposition, but. Um, when I've seen that happen in the past was during the housing downturn, I think it was more in San Joaquin County. I don't know that there was a whole lot of reassessments in Santa Cruz County like there was in, in the rest of the state, but it typically, at least last time, it, it took a couple of years of prices dropping before they started reassessing okay. on, a, on an automatic. Any, anyone can go in at any time and appeal their assessment and, and try to get it reduced. When the housing market crashed after the first couple of years, they just wholesale kind of did all of them, at least in San Joaquin County. Okay, so the lag time is, is pretty slow and probably this county doesn't really respond as much like San Joaquin might have a bigger wiggle than we would, is that what you're saying? So I think the other key thing to keep in mind is, is that you're much more susceptible to that if you have large tracts of housing that are coming up in the market at a particular time. Because, for example, if you've owned your house in Capitola for any period of time beyond two or three years, at this point you have 10, 20, 30, 40 percent. Your assessed value is going to be below what, what the actual market value is. So there's a pretty large buffer for most people. Mm -hmm. It would really only be... Uh, situation where somebody had bought you know relatively close to the economic downturn where they haven't built up that that delta between the market value and the assessed value so because we don't have large tracts of houses that come up for sale in any given year um, I think we're, we're relatively insulated from that and that was our experience during the economic downturn I think we may have had like one year of zero property tax I don't think it ever went negative like in other communities I'm not sure but if it did went negative it was you know one percent at most okay i just want to understand a little bit more about the basis of your assumption there so i think in general uh folks here have probably exhausted everyone in terms of questions are there any more questions of staff I sam have, I have one more. thank you mayor um i wanted to just maybe ask for some additional information on the home program reuse uh, fund we have about a half a million dollars sitting there. Which, what program? Um, I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. Uh, it's the home program oh, right. reuse right, right, fund. Right. Um, and so just maybe what are some eligible activities um, for that fund under the federal guidelines? Um, I can see how it's been used in the past, but... So that that was just my my one request. We don't really have. Okay. That's a yeah. program of money. Okay. We don't have five hundred thousand, do we? Oh, we don't. 
It's under. Double, let me double check. It's that. under special revenue we'll, funds. We'll double check that. So we had a um, couple of account. Our new auditors have a different take on how these funds are are reported, and so we did some. They they want us to book the outstanding loans as available assets. They're not really available assets. I thought I had cleaned all those up, so I, I need to verify that that's okay. Yeah, maybe we give go us. We go by cash balance, not the kind of outstanding loan balance. Yeah, we can't spend the money that we've already loaned to somebody. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let, uh, let me double check we, on that. We can't use it twice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, please, yeah. Well, uh, check in on that and uh, follow up with us about maybe how much is actually, uh, you know, s sitting there in that fund balance. Thank you. And yeah. I, yeah, I, I forgot a post-it question <laughs> with all the all of them up here. I, under the community development block grants, uh, special revenue funds again. It mentions the city has applied for 2.7 million in CDBG funds and anticipates receiving oh. notification in 1819. That's old language. We didn't yeah. get oh. it. Nope. <laughs> okay. I saw that too. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I am commentary uh, for and just requesting more information regarding the the children's fund. But I don't know when we're ready for if when you're ready. Or do you want me to no, no, mention no, it no, now? You have the floor. Um, so regarding the dedicated children's fund, I know that there's the 22,000, um, what do you want to call it? Sir, what's the right terminology? Unbudgeted at this point. Budget, unbudgeted. Yeah, unbudgeted. And um, so again, I ideally would love to utilize some of those dollars for the after school pilot program. So again, I just want to be clear that I would hope that the presentation coming forward um, talks about the sustainability of the the pilot program that it's a year-round program not just a six-week program um, or staggered I would hope that eventually the model would would be something when I, I say year-round I'm referring to a school year year-round program um, so that would be one of the things that I'd, I would like to see the dollars being used on the other would to continue to fund the Santa Cruz Children's Museum of Discovery um, and then the third piece would be to look at um, the usage fees, um, possibly creating some sort of grant program for those who want to come into the city to open up a child care center. So t if a business wants to open, that we would, as a city, possibly waive those, those fees for them. I don't know what the number is. So I don't know if we want to come back with that next time on how much a set aside annually could look like or would ha have to look like in order to to do something like that. Would waive the fees and then use the funds there Thank to support you. the kids. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think um, we need more information. Um, also, uh, as Jim said, uh, the fact which met, uh, I think, last night uh, wanted more information before they could uh, make the recommendation and I have to say the discussion was pretty good and so respecting the fact that they're part of this process I think is um, definitely well founded in terms of how the city works tomorrow um, I mentioned that we have a volunteer dinner and the facts are volu the fact members are part of that volunteer service um, I think we need in general besides more information which I I note that you've been writing down a little bit more information about how uh, the various programs are anticipated developing. What are some of the ideas on the table? Um, just like you bet, I campaign on youth activities too, so I'm very concerned about that. But I also want to give um, professional courtesy to the person who's working on the program to come up with solutions that work really well. Um, I understand that you're going out to all the organs, uh, many of the organizations in this area and I believe you're trying to partner with them where you think feasible and I respect that approach because those organizations are already operating and they have a footprint in the community which means that um, people know about them they have a track record so I kind of like that approach um, when I was campaigning and talking about what I'd like to see for youth I also realized that the city is not in that business 
and we'd have to partner with someone just to even get something off the ground. I think we'll, we have facilities, we have a community room here with the Wi-Fi, we'll have the library pretty soon, and J Street Park props could be a, a facility too, and I know there's uh, issues with uh, scheduling. So I look very forward to you know presentation, and Jim, I look forward to more information so that the FAC and this council here can make better decisions. And I appreciate both of your presentations. Um, the state of the city was good. I think anyone listening got a pretty good idea of where we stand. And um, Jim, I think you went into the detail that's very important for us. And I think everyone had an off ample opportunity to ask questions. No more questions? Sam, you sure? Oh, for now, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, well. <laughs> Maybe one point. I could resist. Did, did you guys get what you needed from us from tonight? I noticed it said, you know, next steps, and tonight it said to identify budget issues to follow our direction on uses for the youth fund. You're all good. Okay. We're good. We, we have did. some ideas for the youth fund that we can bring back some more details. We have a bunch okay. of questions and more information we can develop and bring back slides for our next hearing. Good. All right. Okay. Thank if you. If that's it, Ed? Nope. I'm okay. Fine. Adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much.